We have. I want to dismiss the kids at this time. So if you're there for kids' church, then get going. We have it anywhere from the toddlers all the way up to the fifth grade, fourth grade. Praise God. God is good. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, if you could open up to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 37. Let's jump into God's word this, this morning. All those lights are bright. Praise the Lord. Genesis chapter 37. Hopefully you have your Bible. Get to that. Genesis should be easy to find. In your Bible, I hope it's easy to find. The first book, Genesis chapter 37. I'm going to start reading in verse 3. The Bible says, Now Israel, that being Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he was of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than the, all, the, uh, all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Verse 5, Now Joseph had a dream And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf rose above, rose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered all around it and bowed down to mine. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to to rule over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and for his words. Verse 9, then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told this to his father now and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept this saying in mind. The title of my message today is called The Dreamer. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for allowing us to be in your presence, God. Thank you for allowing us, oh God, to worship your beautiful name. Thank you, God, for allowing us to meet and call ourselves a body, a church. Lord, we do all of these things for you. We don't do these things because we, yes, people come to meet and be with each other, but God, it's about you. You are at the core of what we do. You are the everything, Lord. So bless our time together. Bless this word. Anoint it and speak to your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said Amen, amen. You may be seated in the church. Pastor Mary and Pastor Lee are away. They went away for a brief vacation. Uh, they will be back. They're actually flying back today. But we know, I know they're watching because they always watch. Amen. So we love you, Pastor Mary and Pastor Lee. Have safe travels back home. Um, as you can see, the church is decorated. Is it, doesn't it look lovely? This was, this was decorated for our, uh, because of our academy show that was yesterday. How many of you are involved in the academy, the, the, the academy that we have here? Raise your hand nice and high. Wave it at me. Say hi. Well, I only got like four or five. Wow. Okay. It's all good. Well, yesterday they had their annual Christmas party for the academy, and they had over 100 children in this room. And what I will say about that is a majority of them are not church children. And, um, you know, I, 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 they asked me to come, so, you know, I came a little bit late. Don't judge me. You know what I mean? But... Um, as soon as I walked in, they said, Pastor Sam, do you have something to say? And I had the opportunity to pray over families. Again, people that don't come to the church. Some of the testimonies that I heard, my wife and, and uh, Michael were telling me that, that they started asking kids, well, did you enjoy it? And one kid, one kid said, wait, wait, this is a church? He said, yes, this is a church. She said, I can't believe this is a church. And, and I think it was Joanna was telling the story. He said, what do you mean you don't know this is a church? Well, in my church... They put us all in the corner and they yelled about, they yelled to us the whole time. How can this be a church? She said, well, I got to come back to your church. My wife told me this testimony, what really got me, and the reason why I'm telling you this church is because now the academy has my heart. My wife told me the story of young children that came, they're part of the foster care system. And so the academy, is the academy going since September, right? Since September, so it's only been four months, right? So turn around No, like three and a half months. This family that's in foster care, my wife is telling me they have gone through four foster care families in the three months they've been coming to the academy. But they've been coming to the academy. Amen. But they've been coming to this church where we can speak life over them. Where we can, I got to pray over those children 
yesterday. And to me, I said, that's everything. Amen. See, we don't do things in our church just to say we do things because we're a church. Right. We don't do things just to spin our wheels. We're doing things to reach people. Amen. And that academy with all the dancing and the acting and the art, all, all the stuff, the, these, these uh, paper things, these, these snowflakes were made by children in the academy. Yesterday, they had um, uh, taped to the stage, they had all Christmas ornaments that were painted by kids at the academy. We're reaching people for Jesus because there's a world out there that is hurting and broken. And we as a church need to do everything we can to let people out there know that there is love available for them. The testimony of going to a church and the children going to a corner and being yelled at, that was a real test. That should not be so. Because that's framing the way they think of church going forward. They yell at me. They, they, they just, what is that? Our church should be a church that's full of love and care. And, and so it was a blessing to be here, the academy. I'll be praying for the academy. Michael did an amazing job. Luce did an amazing job. The decorations were. Kathy did an amazing, all that, all those balloons. She is only four foot two, but she got up there and put those things up there, praise God. Um, but Kathy did a great job. Michael did a great job. David was here. Luce, my wife. Uh, uh, Carla, I don't know where Carla is. Carla did an amazing job. So I, 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 can we clap for them? You guys did an amazing, 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 amazing job. And uh, if there's anything I want to encourage you with, you impacted young people with eternity. And that's everything. Are you good this morning, church? I hope you're good this morning, church. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm going to share this word, the dreamer, but um, I, uh, I had a rough week. I had to go to a funeral on Tuesday a funeral for a family, uh, one of my church family people from Newark, beautiful family, and the father, his name is Hillary, passed away this week, passed away, uh, actually passed away last week, but the funeral was Tuesday, so went, to, went there, on, uh, went to the funeral on Tuesday out to Valesburg Assembly um, just to love on them and to obviously support my family, my church family in that moment. And he was a good man. He was a, an army ranger. He was the kind of man that was jumping out of planes. He was a big man, a powerful man, uh, supported me all those years. And as I was listening to the eulogies, I was listening to what they were saying about him, um, it blew my mind that they said, you know, Hillary had a rare form of cancer that there is no cure for. And what caught me is when they said, you know, but if you knew Hillary, and I knew him, he says he's been sick for over 10 years by just coming across him in church or coming across him in the street or being in his home, you would never know he was ill. He was the kind of man that would not complain. He was not the kind of man that would tell you boo-hoo for me and all these kinds of things. He would shake it. He would love you. And he would, his pain, he was in tremendous pain. Like I said, it was a, it's a disease. There is no cure for it. There's something that they don't, it's, it's rare. It's super rare. Um, and it's in his genes. So it might go to his kids. So, so it, it, it's a, it was a ter terrible thing. But, but again, to hear people say, you would never know this man was ill. You would never know that this man had an incurable disease. He went through it quietly. He struggled in silence. He endured pain. He lived his life as though the cancer wasn't there. And I'm going to be honest. I walked away that day with just a burden in my heart thinking about you, my church family thinking about people that are walking in and out of our church or you're a part of our family as pastors, our family, and you're walking in and out of the church and you're going through something quietly. You're struggling, you're battling something. Maybe it is physical, maybe it's something emotional, maybe it's something, you're heartbroken, maybe you're emotionally going through something, you're depressed, you're discouraged. I, I, mental health is a real thing, and it, it breaks my, that there are many forms of pain. There are so many forms of struggle. No one is free from hardship, but it breaks my heart to think that there are people that walk in and out of church, our church, going through it quietly, struggling through the pain, enduring things in the silence. And so... My heart is broken for you this morning, and I think there are many forms of struggle, and I think if we're true and we're honest with ourselves, we are all struggling with something. Those of us who think we're so spiritually advanced and we're so holy, I don't know about you, but the closer you get to Jesus, it seems like the attacks and the struggles get more real. They get more intense. They sh it's hard. It's difficult. You know, sometimes, you know, you got to be honest with a new believer. 
this road is not easy. As much as I want to tell you it's a fun, it's happy, it's all, yeah, Jesus, yeah, that's true. It's amazing. It's amazing work. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. But it is truly warfare. <laughs> the dreamer. Let me read it for you again. Genesis chapter 37. Everyone pretty much knows the story of Joseph. But I want to focus in on the very, very early part of his life. And the Bible says, now Jacob loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors, but when his brothers saw that his father loved him more than his other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. The older brothers treated the younger brother with disdain. They hated him, and Joseph had a dream. And here's the key, Joseph had dreams. God was doing something in this young man. God was doing something, was giving him visions, was giving him things uh, and ideas of things that were not yet happening. But, but God was doing something in this young man. The Bible says when he told it to his brothers, they hated him. A, because he was his father's favorite. But, but, but B, now he starts to have visions. And, and, and if you read it, if you read this in context, verse 5, they said they hated him more. He hasn't even told them what the dream was yet. So something in them provoked them to jealousy. I hate this kid. I wonder if they thought to themselves, this dude is a little bit more spiritual than us. I hate him for that. I hate him that, yes, dad loves him. Yeah, I, I hate him that he's spoiled. But, but, but God even loves him more because he's given him dreams. And you know the dreams. Behold, I was bind we were binding sheaves in the field. Behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered. And the brothers, are you going to reign over us? Again, this anger, are you going to rule over us? The Bible says they hated him more. So in these verses, you see the hate increasing more and more. So they hated him more and more for his dreams and his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told his brothers, said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, the 11 stars are bowing to me. He told it to his brothers, they fought, and him and his father rebuked him. But it's interesting how it says his brothers were jealous, but his father kept it like, hmm, maybe God is up to something. Maybe something is happening. As I think about Joseph and this topic called the dreamer, Joseph was the ultimate dreamer. I believe, and hear me, church, I believe that the Lord wants to speak in dreams again. I believe the Lord wants to co come back and speak to us in visions prophetic things. If you read throughout the Bible, you read throughout the scriptures over and over, the Bible talks about the prophetic being a gift, an active gift in the church. Can I be plain with you? Shoot straight with you. Be totally honest. The gifts are not alive in the church today. I love you. And, and we can say, yeah, we speak in tongues a little bit and this and that. The church, are, the, the, the gifts are not alive in the church. I don't know why we're, I don't know what's happening. I don't want to get into what I think, but they're being suppressed. Let, let, let me read for you what Paul talks about the gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 through 11, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There are a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but in, it is in the same God who empowers them all. To each is given a manifestation of the spirit for the common good. That's the, this stuff should be happening in the church. It's for our common good, the Bible says, right? It says, for one is given the spirit of utterance of wisdom, the another an utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit, another faith by the same spirit, another the gifts of healing by one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another the various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. All of these are empowered by, the, by one and the same spirit who are portions to each and one individually as he wills. I don't know about you, but I have not seen the gifts activated in the church. But I long to see it. I long to see a day where these spiritual gifts are alive and active in our church. But let's talk about dreams and visions, prophetic things. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, Paul, Peter saying this, uh, quoting the book of Joel, and in the last days it shall be, declares the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit in all flesh, and your sons and your so daughters will prophesy. Now, I've been in church a long time. I heard them talk about the last day a lot, but church, it's, it, maybe I'm just getting old, but the last days are coming. They're here. I don't know. 
But the Bible says, I will pour out my spirit and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, let's talk about the, our sons. I'm thinking about our little ones. Could you imagine they come out of I Know Kids this morning talking about, Mom, Dad, I got a word. Mom, Dad, the Lord showed me something in I Know Kids. I got a word, and it's prophetic. And, you, and when they say it to you, you go, oh, my God. The Lord is pouring out his spirit on our sons and our daughters. And they'll prophesy. Then it goes on to say, and your, men, your young men shall see visions. That's our teenagers, our 20s. Could you imagine? I don't want to judge anybody, but, you know, young people, younger than us. The Bible is saying, I'm going to pour out my spirit on a level where the young men are going to start to see visions. Then he goes on to, and the old men, I'll put myself in old because I got some grays. Y'all doing just for men, I don't judge you. But he says, the old gray-haired people will start to dream dreams. Dream dreams. I'm thinking, I want to see that. Church, you ever read the Bible and say, God, I want to see that? No, it's just me. It's all good. It's just me. You awake with me, church? Yes. Do y'all read your Bible? Praise the Lord. Let me say it again. Do you ever read your Bible and say, I want to see that, Jesus? Yes. Do you ever read the book of Acts and say, that church looks different than my church? Yes. Do you ever stop and say, God, how come that can't happen today? This is me. Because my Bible looks different than the version of Christianity I see in my world. I'm going to keep my voice down today. It's Christmas time. <laughs> and it says, on my male servants and on my female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders to the heavens above and in the, in the earth and signs in the earth below, blood and fire, raking and smoke. The, the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God, I want to see that. God, I want to see that. Church, it's not a small thing that there were visions and dreams in the Bible. It is not a small thing that people, it, it, we look at Joseph, well, that was, a, that was a nice thing. It happened over and over again that people in the scriptures would get visions. That they would see things, that God would show things. And I, I want to be very clear. The reason why I'm speaking on this today is because I think there are, there are people, I believe we as a church need to start setting our face back to the place where we can dream again. Where we will seek the face of God for, for really prophetic visions. And, and th because, you know, people, a few years ago, people used to start the prophetic became a church thing again. Oh, I want to go to a church that moves in the prophetic. And they'd be like, well, they think, well, prophecy is just telling people what's going to happen. It's bigger than that. It's more than just, you know, you know uh, 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 rubbing a crystal and, and, and you know, fortune telling. People, you know, prophecy is bigger than that. So when you think of prophecy, you don't say, well, he's going to tell me and I'm going to start having dreams and tell people about the future. Profe prophecy moves in a lot of ways. And I'm here to tell you that, that th there's a level. Again, we haven't reached it yet. Have you ever come across an old saint that you were afraid to talk to. I told you this before. There were some old timers. I'm because I knew that they knew Jesus so good that when they looked at my life, they would prophesy and they would speak things that would break me. Because they would, you knew, like those old gray haired dudes, you know, the. Y'all understand what I'm saying this morning? I miss those old timers in the church. I miss those old timers that would come up to you and shake your hand and pull you real close and tell you the Lord's been talking to me about you. The Lord's been warning me things about you. You ever come across a person like that that pulls you in real close and they start prophesying over your life right there on the spot? We need to get back to a place where the Lord is free to invade our minds, our match, invade us that we can dream again. Jacob had a dream. Do you remember the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 28? I won't read it for you. The Bible says he's traveling. He puts his head on a rock. And the Bible says, if you take a note, it's Genesis chapter 28 verse 11. The Bible says he puts his head on a rock and the Lord opened heaven. And he said he saw heaven open and angels ascending and these things. My man was in the wilderness on a rock. 
And God gave him a vision. The Bible tells us Isaiah was given glimpses. Isaiah chapter 6, you know this story. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Church, we need to get back to a place where the train of the robe fills the temple. And, and the fact that people can see it, that God's people can see the Lord is here. A young man came up to me before service started and grieved my heart. He said, Pastor, the Lord is in the room. But people would rather talk to each other. They'd rather be on their phone. See, the train of his robe is trying to fill the temple. We're so distracted. We stay focused. Isaiah said, above him stood seraphim. Each had six wings, two covered his face, two covered his feet, two covered, and then with two he flew. And then they called to another saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts who fills the earth full of his glory. God, if we can get a vision again. If we could dream, dream. Could you imagine? This is the kind of vision that the church needs because this will transform the church. A vision like this, the train of his robe filling the temple, seraphim, holy, holy, holy. I don't know about you, but if I woke up from that dream, the first place I would go is on my knees. I would lay out saying, oh my God, you have given me a glimpse of your glory. The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who, at the voice of him who called and the house filled with smoke. And, he, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king. Vision. A dream. Church, hear my voice. I can hear the voice of the Lord saying, this was not just for Isaiah. See, in the Old Testament, God will put his hand on specific people in specific seasons. That's Old Testament stuff. But when Jesus came, he opened this avenue of dialogue with the king, with the holy of holies, so we should all be in this place of, I see vision. I've seen the Lord. Smoke filled the room, thunder in his voice. <laughs> this is what I, I don't know about you, but I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming. Because I want to see this. Over and over, Jeremiah will get a word. Ezekiel had a vision of a valley of dry bones. Peter in the New Testament was corrected in a dream and a vision in Acts chapter 10. Cornelius wasn't even a disciple, but was divinely directed by a dream. Paul had multiple visions. Some of them would correct him. Some of them would tell him, you are not going to do this. You're going to do this because I want you to do that. See, so this was a common occurrence in the New Testament church. Paul was getting this like, okay, Lord, you don't want me to go over to there? I won't go over there. You want me to go over there? I'll go over there. He'd be corrected. All kinds of things were happening in dreams. In first, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 12, if you read it, he talks about, I, I had gone to the third heaven. Was I in my body? Out of my body? I don't know. But the Lord talked to me there. This was a common occurrence in the life of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. Church, can we, start, can, can, we, can we start to think about, God, what do you want to do with us? See, because I love you, church, but coming to church and a feel-good Sunday morning message and making your flesh feel good, that's not, that's not a relationship. That's not communion with the Father. That's just church attendance, and that's not going to get you anywhere. See, and we miss this. Don't clap. It's all good, right? But, but, but I, I need to tell you this, church, I long to see a day where we really, where the Bible, we're living it, where we're doing this, where, 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 where we don't read our Bible like me and marvel, wow, that's amazing. I want us to get to a place where we can say, yeah, I did that too. My church is doing that too. So here is Joseph getting these dreams. Here is Joseph not afraid to speak these dreams. Here is Joseph just getting these heavenly downloads, let's say. 
But again, I believe that there are people in this room that God wants to give you some dreams. Wants to give you some visions. Wants to open the prophetic to your life. You know why I like talking to young people and kids? Because when they dream, they really dream. They don't know the cost. They don't know how much it's going to cost to get where they got to get. They just like, ask the little ones, go into I Know Kids, ask the little ones, tell me a dream that you have with your life. They'll tell you, to, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. You'll be like, all of these things. Yeah, I want to be an archaeologist. I want to study stuff in the ocean. I'm sitting there going, that's gonna, I told my daughter, that's going to cost me a lot of money. How are you going to do all that? Let's pick. But kids, they don't worry about what it's going to take to get there, how what it's going to look like to get there. They just want to do it. They, this is amazing, and I want to go. Adults, we start counting the cost. We start looking at what it's going to take. And can I tell you right now, that will hinder the spiritual gifts coming alive in your life. Because if you count the cost of how hard it's going to be, you're already lost. Let me tell you why I think we don't have dreams, visions, and prophetic things happening in our church and we're hindered. I think it's a matter of faithlessness. I'm sorry. Am I being too rough this morning? I love y'all. But the church has to be a place, Pastor Ren said it, we walk by faith, not by sight. Some of us are so caught in our day-to-day that we are faithless in our spirituality. We are faithless. Faithlessness will get no mighty miracles, no signs, no wonders, because we're coming in here, we're singing songs. You could do that at a concert for some secular. We could be a bunch of secular Christians up in here, just doing things for show, you know, and that's why we cannot make fun of other religions. Don't make fun of Catholic people. Do not make fun of Catholics. They come to church, they get up, they do the rosary, that. You know what? Because, because we charismatics do the same thing. We do things on routine. We do things on autopilot. We come to church just to do things. And you think, you think the Lord gets any glory and you, glory, you just sing in a routine song? God don't care about you. Why don't we see things happening? Why don't you see? Why don't I see? And I, I preach to myself. is because I need an infusion of faith in my life. I need more faith. Somebody walked into this room right now, a cripple, that said, heal me. I would have a problem with my faith. I'm just being 100%. So, Lord, work on my faith. Again, I read a lot, and so when I hear of miracles and signs being done in third world countries, it blows my mind. We need faith. If you're in this room and do not have faith, coming to church is nice. Singing the songs, they're nice. Tithing is nice. Being involved in the ministry is nice. nice. But if you don't have faith, Let's talk about what kind of faith. Faith in, in him. Not faith in our church, not faith in a pastor. Yes, it's good that you have faith in some people, but you have to believe that Jesus is who he said he is. Have to. You have to believe that he said, you have to believe that that cross was real. And you can say, well, that's no story. I mean, you can prove that stuff. I'm just telling you, you have to believe that what he did on that cross was the truth. That was the beginning and the end of my faith, the cross. It, was the, it is the centerpiece. If you come into this room and the devil's trying, he's lying to you, that doubt, you got to doubt the cross stuff and all that, you need to get a hold of yourself because if you don't know who Jesus is, you have lost. All the stuff that we do is not so we can glory in any one individual. It's all about the man Jesus Christ and what he did on that cross that faithful day. It's all about that. And then on top of that, it's I got to believe that what he said is real. If he said it, that's got to be what I bank my life on. Put everything that I have on what God's word says. If Jesus, some of us need to stop. We try to read biblical scholars. Just read the red letters. If you don't have a Bible that has red letters, go buy a Bible that has red letters. Because the red letters mean this is what Jesus said. And if anybody needs to be talked about or studied, it should be what Jesus said. A lot of people want to study the Pauline epistles or great theology of Romans. Read what Jesus said. Just do what he said. If you can do that, let me tell you something, you'll be one holy person. Faith in that individual. Hebrews 11:1 says, faith is the assurance 
of the, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You have, do you have a conviction in you? A conviction that I know who God is. I know. See, you can't be shaken from that. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Impossible. So, again, I love you. Us coming to church is not pleasing him. It's good. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm sure he likes it. But if you come to church without faith, I wonder, you can sing the song, but you don't believe what you're singing. What's the point? You can carry the biggest Bible that you have. If you don't believe it, you're carrying a book. It's a textbook. Just carry a newspaper. Conviction. Without faith, it's impossible. Watch, what the, watch this promise. For whoever would draw near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who, oh, King James says, diligently seek him. Diligently going after him. Diligently all the time. Diligently, whether it's easy or hard, I will diligently seek you, Lord. The second thing I think that hinders us from seeing the gifts activated in the church, let's be plain here because we got to make sure we talk about it, it's sin. You can't live like the devil on Saturday. Come to church on Sunday talking about, Lord, baptize me in the Holy Ghost. He's called the Holy Spirit. Not that you and I can be holy, we're trying our best day, but sin. Church, we got to come to a place where we love the Lord more than we love our own flesh. We have to love him more than we love ourselves. We have to love him more than we love our creature comforts. Because if you put him on the secondary shelf, the third shelf, and you put your flesh above him, you put your wants, your needs, then your needs and your wants and your flesh, guess what they're going to do? They're going to win. It's okay if you're quiet. First John chapter 3 says it like this. Little children, let's read the Bible. Let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. But whoever makes a practice of sinning, I love you, church. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning since, the, since from the beginning. And the reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Okay, let's freeze for a second. There's a difference between a sinner, because we're all sinners. Let's keep it 100. Everybody in this room, even though you came to the Lord, you could be the most holiest person in this room. You still sin. You, you still jack up on sin. You, it's what it is. But there's a difference between a person that falls, makes a misstep, than a person who makes a practice of sinning. There's a difference. So if you're in this room, don't get it all the conviction. I made a mistake. You get to make him. The Bible says that, that he is free. He will forgive you of all. He will forgive you. It's all good. He is just to forgive. Of all. That's fine. But let's talk to the people who practice sinning. That's the way of your lifestyle. But what, what you want to come to church? Now, I love you. And I want you to come to church. I want you to be a part of this body. But let's not get, let's not get, let's not get twisted. You think you're... You, you, Sinning on a regular basis, if your life is full of sin, full of sin, full of sin, and you have no repentance, then you are far from God this morning. You are not close to the Lord. You are not in communion. You are, and, and the Lord loves you, and he wants to talk to you, and he wants to move in your life. But listen, if your life is full of practicing sin, if that's your lifestyle, then don't tell me you have communion with the Father because he hates sin. And he wants no part of sinful, of people that are living their lives full of sin and just going out and just, am I making sense this morning? Now, it, let, let's back up a second. If you, anyone in this room who is practicing or their lifestyle, I'm here to tell you that one moment, one, one, one moment with Jesus changes everything. All of us were practicers of sin in our life. All of us. There is none in this room. There is none righteous. No, not one. But the key here is, let's go back to talk about Jesus, if you will let me. 
We are all sinners, all of us. All of us should be destined for hell, all of us. There is not one person in this room that's holy on their own, not one. You could come and say, Pastor, I live a good life because you've all heard those, heard those arguments before. Or some of you may say, oh, you know, you know, Pastor, I believe in your Jesus, but I also believe in that other religion. And, oh, we're all going to get to heaven. No, it doesn't work that way. We're all sinners. Buddha can't get you to, they can enlighten you as much as you want, but he can't save your soul. Do you understand what I'm saying? You could be in this room and practice all of the Eastern philosophies, all that you like. You could get peaceful, feel peaceful on the inside. Your mind could have peace once in a while. And you could pray to some other God and go to church. And you could, I'm not going to mock anybody, but I'm here to tell you, none of those other things, none of those religions, none of those practices can save your soul. They don't have it in their religion. They don't have it in their pages for a way for you to save your soul. You know what they would tell you? Well, if you do these 10 things, you might have a chance. Can I be honest with you? I can do 20 things. I don't got a chance. I can be as righteous as I want to be this Sunday morning, but let me tell you, the minute I walk out of this church I am, and I choose to be far from God, I will be far from God. These are the choices that I make, and these are the choices that you make this morning. There is no one that can save you but, 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 but one. But one. Remember we talked about the conviction. I have a conviction in my spirit. I have a conviction in my soul. I have a conviction in my life, and it's this, that I was the lost of all the lost. I grew up in church. The Lord spoke to me when I was young, and I walked away, yet he did not leave me. He waited for me patiently while I did my stupidity in the world, and he, his love made him wait for me. I, how God could wait blows my mind. Why God would even have that kind of, the Bible called long suffering, you know what I mean? That his suffering goes long way where he sees his heart is broken by the things we were doing, yet he stood there waiting. Some of you don't even understand. You think, you, you, oh, I want to go to church. Something's happening. Let me tell you something. The Lord is calling some people in this room. He's waiting for you. His hand is on your life. His fingerprints on your soul. And he's waiting for you to come. Why? Because he loves you. More than your mother loves you, more than your father loves you, more than you love your children. He loves you. How do I know? Again, I have a conviction because he loved me when I was unlovable. Because he loved me when I wasn't looking to him. Because he loved me when I would curse him and say, get away from me. He stood there, took that, and said, but I still love you. And I will wait for you. When we get to heaven and I look at the big DVD screen of my life and I look at the amount of times I said no to him. Yet he stood there saying, I'm waiting for you. And if you're in this room right now and you're far from God, you're backslidden, you don't know the Lord, I mean to tell you, one moment in the presence of the king changes everything. One moment in the presence of the Lord. What I tell you about Jesus is not a lie. Why? But I bank my life on what I'm telling you because he changed me. He changed me. I look back on my life and I thought I was a good man until he changed me. Then I saw what I really was. I thought I was trying to live a good life, be a good human, have a good person, be good, do my job right, do this right. But I was still so far. But he loved me. If you're in sin this morning, if you're far from God, if you're, I don't care if you have an addiction in your life, for me to tell you that can be broken this morning. Amen. Pastor Reddy talked about baking generational curses. Let me tell you something. Generational curses stop when one person that's a part of that generational curse says, I've had enough, and in Jesus' name, I'm breaking this thing over my life. Amen. Some of you in this room may have change over your life, and they've been in your life for a long time. I'm here to tell you, a moment in the presence of God, you will gain strength to look at those chains and say no more. Some of us have sins that have been fighting us, fighting us. And let me tell you, sometimes they get us. But let me tell you, the fight, the sin that I fight, let me tell you, it may get me, it may bite me once in a while, but that sin will not have me. That sin does not have my life. That sin will not be the end of me. That sin will not be my end. Why? Because I am a child of the Most High God. I know who I am. I know in whom I have believed. I walk with the King on a daily basis, and He gives me strength for every day. There is no battle that I fight that I can't win, church. There is no battle that you fight that you can't win if you are in Jesus Christ this morning. Remember what I'm saying? God wants to unleash gifts in his church, and I believe that's where we need to be. 
But we need to be a people of faith and a people that don't walk around practicing sin on a regular basis. We need to be a people that genuinely care about the holiness of God. I love you, church. But some of us are going to go home after this service and we're going to put junk on that stupid TV. That is unholy. See, you can't talk a holy game but live an unholy. It don't work like that. Some of us, you know, church, we, okay, I'm speaking to the whole church. Some of you are going to get it. Some of you care about what I'm saying. Some of you don't. But I'm, let me talk to the remnant. See, I believe there's a remnant. See, the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of people come to Sunday morning services. But not all of us are going to make it. The Lord's going to come one day, and he's going to come for all. He's gonna just, all of us are going to hear the trumpet. And some of us who know a little bit of things, or maybe we're here and we're hearing what I'm saying, listen, the trumpet's going to sound. It's going to be heartbreaking for us as leaders and pastors to see people that we've talked to about the things of God. We try. But when that trumpet sounds, the Bible says we're going to be in the air. The heartbreaking thing is, look, in my heart is looking down at people who are not going. To me, that, that is the dread of my soul. I have spiritual sons in this room, spiritual daughters in this room. All of us as pastors do, we have. And my, my hope is that when that trumpet sounds, I see all of my children go. I see it's all, I see, I can see. Yeah, there she goes, there she goes, there he goes, there he goes. But the dread of my soul is I'm gonna be, but where is so and so? We did church together. Ten years we did church. We did ministry together. We were in those Holy Ghost revival meetings. We were there when James and They were there. They were weeping. We were side by side. Where are they? That's the dread of every pastor's soul. That when the trumpet sounds, some of us are going and some of us are not. It's the dread of my soul. And I can't do anything for you. Even right now, all I can do is tell you the only hope that you have is in that name. The only hope that you have. Listen, the church can come and go. The Bible talks about all this stuff is going to be burned. All this stuff is rubble. All of this stuff is nothing. It's window dressing. This amount of nothing. But your soul matters. Jesus said, don't be afraid of the ones that can harm you or hurt you. This and this and this. And this. Be weary of the one who can do something to your soul. Think about the one who can save your soul this morning. John, uh, the beloved said, do not love the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is all the things that are in there, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world those desires of your heart, that appetite of indulging in the things of the flesh, the things that incite you and inflame that, that, that flesh in you, the things that your eyes are drawn to, the riches, the rich possessions, these things, covetousness, this vanity that our, our flesh craves. Even us as leaders, people that love to be honored and applauded, those are prideful things that should have no business in the people of God. And these are the things that will keep some of us from experiencing the fullness of the Lord. Not only eternity, but I'm talking about right here, right now. As we go about our church life, as we go about, like I talked about the gifts, these are the kinds of things when we're looking on ourselves, when we're prideful, when we're trying to, when we'd rather feed the flesh than the spirit. It's a problem. I believe that God has spoken many things over people in this room. I think God has given dreams to people in this room. I believe God wants to, I believe he has probably, I, I'll just say, I, I think God has already done some things in this room and we're hindering the things that he wants to do. I don't know about you, but we're hindering him. Another reason why I think that we're not getting 
the fullness of the spirit, or again, I'm talking about dreams and visions, is that the big mistake that Joseph made was that he told people that were not worthy of telling. Did I say that right? Told people. He told the wrong people the prophetic thing that God told him. He lacked discernment in that moment, really. Can, can, I, can I tell you something, church? I think the reason why some of us are not getting what God has for us, the reason why the, the, the gifts in the church are not moving is because we're allowing voices into our lives that are diminishing the voice of God. And you can't share everything with everyone. There are people that are, should not be privileged to knowing the things that God is speaking to your life. See, because some of us, and, and let's be real, Jesus was the, Jesus had a Judas, and so will you. Amen. You will have Judases in your life. And those Judases will listen to what you tell them about what Jesus wants to do, and this and this and that. And let me tell you, that jealousy, dare I say, they will talk against what God is trying to do in your life. I have known jealousy in the church. I have known, I knew a young man that was destined to be great in the things of the world. Destined. Man, he was going to be, he came, you could see, like when you could see something on someone, you're like, that dude's going to get it. But even in the church, he aligned himself with the wrong people. And the circle that he ran with actually started to say things that you could be like, because they would say things like, how come he gets to do that and not me? And I just think to myself, does your boy know you're talking like that? D does your man know that you're talking like you want his shot? I thought that was your... I thought y'all ran together. Like, in the church, you guys are best friends, but he's getting a little bit of shine, and you're like, but, but how come I don't get that? Wow. The Bible tells us that his own brothers were jealous. His own brothers, they got mad at him. They hated him. They couldn't speak peacefully to him. They didn't understand the vision. Let me tell you something. Some of you in this room are running with a crowd that will not understand what God's trying to do in your life. I know I say this to young people all the time, but I'm going to say it to adults too. If you really want to do the things of the Spirit, if you really want to run, if you really want to go run, fly with eagles, you got to stop hanging out with pigeons. I'm just, let's keep it real, because you have these people that are destined for greatness, yet they're, they're, they're chained to people who are beneath, and I'm not trying to be foul here, but let's be real. If you want to be something, our parents always said it, right? Tell me who you are, I'll tell you who you're with. It's true spiritually. You want to be filled with power of the Holy Ghost? Find yourself a group of people that are filled with power of the Holy Ghost. You want to, you want to pray more? Find yourself some people that know how to pray. You want to be an evangelist, a preacher? You want to move in the gifts of God? Find people who are moving in the gifts of God and be like, yo, I want to hang with those people. Amen. And there's nothing wrong. Like, we have to befriend people and move with people. We have to know when, when it's, when it, we have, some things are missional. Like, we're going after people. We're going to we're try to reach these people for Jesus. But when it's time for me to, when, it's, when, when I need to fill my tank up a little bit, I need to be around strong people that are strong spiritually. I need to be around people that are searching after the same thing that I'm searching after. Joseph was hanging around with a bunch of brothers, and you know what those, bro those brothers were scoundrels. They weren't worthy of his dream. They didn't discern his dream. Anger and bitterness and jealousy got a hold of that dream. Some of you are going to go home and hear words like, oh, you're just one of those super religious fanatical people. Oh, you're one of those people. Some of you are going to go to your home and you're going to be the only person seeking the face of Jesus. The only person seeking the anointing of God. Let me tell you something. Don't get your advice from those people. As much as you love them, as much as they're your family, as much as I love them, let me tell you something. Spiritually, that's not where you get your advice from. That's not the people. You got to love them. They're your family and we're going to try to win them for Jesus, no doubt. But you don't get full on them. You don't go to them with, you know, all their Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil stuff. You keep that stuff. You keep all that nonsense. 
Let me find myself someone that's in the things of the Lord. Let me get my advice. If I need some, uh, ask somebody, don't ask somebody to pray for you that's beneath your prayer life. Can I be honest? Let me just be real with you. Because if you're trying to touch heaven, you need somebody that can pray big prayers. You know, you get me? Some people need healing. You need, you need some, you need to go to somebody that knows how to pray. Find people that know how to pray. I know people that have dreams and they, they talk to the weirdest people. I had a dream. That, that person don't. Well, I want, to dream. I want people to dream again. I also think one of the reasons, and I'm almost done, one of the reasons that people give up on visions, one of the reasons I think people give up on really getting a hold of the gifts of the Spirit is because those things cost something. I have never known any giant in the things of the Lord, and I know a few, that their lives have not been marked by suffering. When I was at Times Square Church, Pastor Carter, one time his house burned on fire. One of his kids got in the fire. When I was growing up, my old pastor, we were in Brooklyn, he was walking his fiance home, got mugged, got stabbed, killed. Um, Ben Crandall, Ben Crandall, man of God, one of the deans of, um, he was on Zion, North Point, his only daughter, car crash, kill, his only daughter. This man was the good friend of Corey Ten Boom. Stories this man would tell about Corey Ten Boom was crazy. Only daughter. He would tell you the faithful day they came to his door. The daughter is gone. Um, Pastor Dave Wilkerson, you know him, uh, that's a spiritual giant. Whole family ravaged with cancer. The whole family. Little kids, the whole thing. See, and the problem is, is that if we want to be p- real people and we really want everything God has for us, we have to be ready for some suffering. I believe that the church is spoiled because we want everything smooth, nice, and easy. And can I dare say, the giftings of the Spirit are not going to come nice and easy. I think there's some suffering that has to happen. I think there's some, there's some refining that has to happen that can only happen in fire. You see, the Bible tells us that Joseph got sold into slavery. And when you read the story, if you read it for the first time, it's horrible. He got sold by his brothers and like, oh my God, that's horrible. But then the Bible goes on to say, but when he got to Potiphar's house, he was blessed. And you go, oh, the story's about to take an upturn. And he's, he's blessed. Every, the Bible says everything in Potiphar's house was blessed because of Joseph. And blessing started falling, and blessing, and blessing. And he's minding his own business, trying to be holy, and here comes Potiphar's wife. And the temptation comes. See, a lot of Christians are right here in this spot. And there's a temptation, or I can do it, or if I don't do it, I don't know what's going to happen. Some of us would rather like the comfort of knowing what's going to happen than leaving things up to the unknown. See, so really what I'm saying is some of us will lay down with the sin because that's the easy road. But Joseph said, no, I'm not doing this. And the Bible says he ran from that woman. And here's what gets me. Uh, Potiphar finds out, throws him in jail, the whole thing. Genesis chapter 41 says, uh, for the... Craziest words, and for two whole years, my man stood in that jail cell. For two whole years. You know what the Bible tells us about those two whole years? Because if that were me, I'm be, be in my flesh, I'd be like, Lord, I took it when they sold me into slavery and I worked really good. I took what they did to me and I became second in the house of Potiphar and I, I served him and everything was blessed. But Lord, why am I here? What did I do to deserve this? I ran from the mistress. I did the right thing. And I find myself for two whole years, I'm in this jail cell by myself. See, there are many of us Christians that will say, we say we'll go through it. Lord, I got you. Lord, I'll go through it. But after the two months, we're like, okay, time out, Lord. This is too hard. 
Oh, may some of us are really holy. Six months, I got this. Six months, I got this jail cell. A year, I'm not, I'm, I'll be in my flesh. A year comes around, I'm counting the days. Lord, what's going on? What did I do wrong? You ever pray that to the Lord? What did I do wrong? Why am I here? Tell me, Lord, why am I suffering like this? Why am I suffering? There are people in this room, you are suffering, you're going through it, and you're looking at the circumstances, and you're like, Lord, but why am I here? Can I, can I tell you that your suffering has a purpose? Your suffering has a purpose. Some people don't get it. Some people don't understand, but the Lord sees. Some of you, when you worship in that suffering, man, when you open up that alabaster box, y'all know the story of, you know what I'm saying? That little alabaster box has more, has more value to God than all of us singing. Some of us that are in this room that are suffering, that are going through it, the praise that you bring out of your suffering is of great value to the Lord. Some of you, <laughs> there's a woman in this room, I will not point her out, but last week she was glowing, glowing, walking around hugging people with joy. I was like, wow, and she's amazing, by the way. Then my wife goes to me after, but you don't understand. What don't I understand? She got a bad doctor's report. What? But the joy. God. That was on that woman's face. I said, how can this be? How can this be? And when I watch her worship, and I watch her worship, and when I say, there's more joy. God is getting more glory out of that one box, that one alabaster box, than all of us singing at the top of our lungs, because out of the suffering, Lord, I give this to you still. That's the kind of person I want to roll with. That's the kind of person, I'm talking about a prayer warrior, that's the kind of person you need to attach yourself to because that person, the highs and the lows, I will still seek the face of my Jesus. In the highs and the lows, I will still worship him. Sarah said it, sometimes we don't feel like it, but that individual is like, I don't care what's happening to my body, I will give glory to the Lord. That's the kind of person that's going to see some things. Dare I say that that woman is going to see a vision. That woman's going to see some dreams. That woman's going to have healing in her hands. That woman, when she worships, heaven starts to rejoice. Because she looked at it a whole two years and said, I will still worship you. Some of us, if God gave us the whole vision, I don't know about you, but sometimes God gives me a glimpse. Because if God showed me the whole thing, I would quit. I got to go through what? I had to do two years after I did all this good, Lord. You got prison waiting for me? I don't know. So I don't know I'll speak for myself. I'd be like, uh, time out. There's got to be another way. But blessed are those that endure suffering. Because the Bible says we must endure suffering as he endured suffering. You want to be like Jesus? You want to be holy? You want to be set apart for the things of the Lord? Be ready to endure some hard things. Be ready to go through a trial. Be ready to go through some things that are going to be difficult and too hot. You'll be questioning what is going on. But let me read this to you. Philippians 1, 6 says, I am sure of this, Paul writes, that he who began the good work in you will bring it to completion until the Lord comes. Y'all quiet this morning. It's all good. But I don't know about you, but I stand on this. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, because the work you started in me, you're not done yet. Some people in this room, you're going through some things. You're, you're battling or whatever, and I'm here to tell you, God wants to unlock some beautiful things in your life, and you're down and you're out. I'm here to tell you, it's for a season. The Lord is not done with you yet. It's not over till he says it's over. Your suffering that you're going through in the body, worship while you go through that suffering in the body. That battle that you're going through in your mind, I'm here to tell you, push back those thoughts of discouragement and worship the Lord while you're in discouragement. And 
dare I say to you, the Lord will show off a little bit in your life. Those of you may be battling depression, I'm here to tell you that you need to take that depression and say, depression, move to the side for a moment because I need to worship my king this morning. Nothing's going to stop me from worshiping my Lord this morning. Some of you got a bad marriage. Your husband's not serving the Lord. Let me tell you, don't let that dude stop you from worshiping the king. You worship anyway, and maybe your husband will get the overflow of what the Lord is doing in your life. Your family is insane. They're going through some things. Don't you stop seeking the face of the Lord. Don't you stop that song in the middle of the night. The peace that you bring into that home may be the only peace that they receive. You are the only Jesus that some people will ever see. Don't you stop singing that song. Don't you stop worshiping in the middle of the night. The Bible tells us that Peter was in that, was it Peter in that jail cell and he started to sing in a prison. Or was it Paul? They were in that prison and the prisoners, the Paul, right? The prisoners weren't singing. The prisoners didn't care about their freedom. The prisoners didn't care about what was going to happen, but he decided to sing that day. He decided to raise up a Holy Ghost song. He decided, and guess what? The people that were in the jail cell, guess what they got? Freedom too. So dare I say that some of you in this room, why, dare I say that in your suffering people are looking at you? Let me see how they're going to deal with that bad report. Let me see how they're going to deal with the brokenness of their family. Let me see how they're going to deal with that addiction because I'm going through it just like them. <laughs> there's a reason. Dare I say there's a reason. I got to end. Josh, if you would come. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 45, if you don't know the story, you can read the story of Joseph. But long story short, the Bible tells us that his brothers come to him and they give him food. There's all kinds of stuff going on. But, but Joseph happens to, he says that the brothers are really scared. That, oh my God, we sold him into slavery. Oh my God, we've done all these things. Oh my God, he's going to kill us. And this is what Joseph said. He says, don't be distressed or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me here to preserve your life. I went through all of that. I battled all of that. Yes, I did prison. Yes, you sold me. Yes, it was wrong. But you didn't do this. God did this because there was a purpose in the journey. There was a purpose in everything. He says in verse 8, it was not you who sent me here, but God. But God put me on this journey. But God did this to me. But God put me in that jail cell. It was God who sold me into slavery. And why? There was a purpose so that I could be the one to save you. Amen. Church, we need to get the gifts activated again. Why? Because the Lord has something he wants to do still on this earth. There's something he wants to do right here in Jersey City. There's something he wants to do right here in this church. And it's going to take a people really dedicate themselves to holiness. No matter what we go through, no matter the suffering, no matter the hardships, we got to distance ourselves from people that are dragging us down, all that stuff. Like I said, we need to get away from sin. We need to infuse ourselves with faith. Why? Because the Lord is going to take us. And maybe he's taking you through some things right now. I believe that some of you are going through it. But there is a purpose because there are people on the other side that need to see your victory. I had a conversation with a young man on Friday. Mike De Los Santos was with me. I taught the junior highs on Friday. It was a beautiful time. Young man comes up to me after. He goes, Pastor Sam, in tears. I mean, in tears. I got to talk to you. I said, what's the matter? I'm struggling, Pastor Sam. I'm struggling right now. The kid had been on more than 12 years old. I had a lust problem. Okay. Tell me what's happening. And he told me. Went through his phone and all this stuff. In that moment, I could preach to him all I want. I could preach to him. I could pray for him. I could do all kinds of stuff. I try to be all holy, religious. At that moment, see, some of y'all don't understand that some of the battles you're fighting, it's not even for you. See, if you give up on some of the battles that you're fighting, we're going to lose some people. So I'm with this young man. I put my arm around him. I said, my bro, I've been there. I've been through that battle. I've been through that fight. I've, 
I know what you're going through. I've been there with you. I've fought that fight. I fought that fight. You see, at that point, that wasn't the time to quote him a thousand scriptures. It wasn't time to do it. It was time to just put my arm around him and say, I got that victory for you. I got it for you. It's possible. You can do it. I can look him in the face and say, it's not over. The battle's not over. I've suffered. I've fought. I've I fought with that sin. I've wrestled with that sin year after year after year. But I'm here to tell you, I made it. I made it. And I can look him in the face, 12-year-old young man, and you're going to make it. You're going to make it. It's not over for you. The devil can't have you, young man. I'm living proof that it's not over. See, I was able to look him in the face because I had done the whole two years. Because I had gone through the being sold. I, I had gone through the heartache of people turning their back. But you know, it's all for a purpose. I'm learning now. It's all for a purpose. Some of you grown women in this room that have been through, you know that there's a generation that need moms. They need spiritual parenting. It's real. Like, it's real. And I'm, I mean, first of all, I can't do it by myself. I got a lot of spiritual sons. It's overwhelming. How many young people come to me with so many things? I'm like, yo, I, it's hard. And we need some godly young men and godly young women that won't say, to be a spiritual mom, say, I got this. And pull a young lady to the side in their brokenness and say, I've been there. I've been down that road of brokenness. I've been down that road of, of abandonment. I've been on that, that road of, 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 of lost love and love and all lost love. I've been through all of these things, but, but I made it. I've gone through the suffering. Some of you that are battling in your mind, maybe battling in, 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 your, in your health, can get up here and give testimony to the goodness of God and tell people, I made it. It's not over for you. It's not over for you. It's not over for you. It was not you who sent me here, but God. But God. That was Joseph the dreamer. His life started by God speaking into his life, saying, Joseph, I'm going to do things in your life. Spoke to him in dreams and said, I'm going to do this. He didn't get it. But God's plan for his life came to fruition. And I believe it's because he, he stuck with it. He stayed in the game. He didn't give up. And I believe that God wants to pour out his spirit on his people. I believe he wants to give us dreams and visions. He wants to speak to people about what he's going to do, what he wants to do. I believe that in this church right now, we have, we have all that this church needs to get to the next level. I don't think we have to wait for another person to come into the church and get saved. I think all that we need to take this church to the next level is already in this room. But it's going to take a people that's going to say, I'm going to be a person of faith. Faith, supernatural faith. It's going to be people that are tired of their sin. I think it'd be bold enough to walk away from those sinful things. I think it's going to be a people that are going to say, you know what, through the suffering, through the pain, through the difficulty, through the moments of not understanding what's happening, the discomfort, I will still move forward in the things of the Lord. Like I said, maybe you say, I've been here for a whole two years suffering. I've been going through it. I'm here to tell you, don't give up. Maybe like Joseph, I'm, I'm in a land. I don't know why I'm here in Egypt. I don't know why, but God's like, I brought you here for a reason and a purpose. There's purpose for you. Everybody in this room, there's purpose for you. I don't care how young you are or how old you are or you think you're too far gone or you can't speak right, you're not educated enough. I'm here to tell you those are all lies from the pit of hell. God has a plan and a purpose for your life and he wants to see those giftings and those, 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 those gifts come out of your life. This church cannot move forward without your gift being, being used. The Bible says we are a body. 
We are a body. Ligaments, hands, feet. All of us are the body. So some of us need to get engaged in what we're doing here. I hope it made sense to you this morning. I hope. Everybody head and close your eyes, if you would.